Multiple enclosed indoor amusement parks exist around the world, from the Adventure Dome to Nickelodeon Universe. They offer a fun way to ride exciting attractions without having to close due to poor weather. England, a place known for its bad weather, has none of these. Though, that wasn't always the case. Gateshead, in the north of England, was previously home to Europe's largest indoor amusement park. Metroland operated for 20 years, before being closed and replaced. Enclosed shopping malls began to appear in America in the mid-1950s and would become incredibly popular as retail stores began to move out of downtown sections of cities across the country. By the 1980s, they became the go-to place for shopping needs or just to hang out with friends. In England, the first and largest indoor shopping centre, we don't call them malls, opened in 1964 in Birmingham. Inspired by American suburban malls, the ball ring promised shopping in air-conditioned, temperature-controlled halls that were described as the biggest indoor shopping centre outside of the US. The ball ring shopping centre is changing the buying habits of millions of Midlanders from Birmingham and beyond. They come in thousands every day by train to New Street Station and through to the shops. While the majority of shopping still happened in town centres, more shopping centres would open over the next decade, each bigger and offering more than the last. By the mid-80s, shopping centres were more common, many located as enclosed sections of town centres. The first out-of-town shopping centre opened in North London in 1976, called Brent Cross, and was known as the first American-style mall in the UK. In the north of England, something different was being worked up. Another out-of-town shopping experience that would not only be the largest centre in the UK, but the whole of Europe. The idea began in 1979 and would take seven years to become a reality. Tyneside was once the source of much of Britain's wealth. Today, it is a byword for industrial decline. But two years ago, in the midst of this wasteland, a brave new world was built. The Metro Centre is the brainchild of a 55-year-old northern property developer, John Hall. It's the beginning of a personal crusade to regenerate the northeast. It's also a model of the sort of society he wants Britain to become. Located in Gateshead, England, John Hall, managing director of firm Cameron Hall, would be behind the idea and wanted to turn the derelict riverside at Dunstan into the mecca of shopping and leisure in Europe. He had ideas for dry ski slopes, spaces for children to have fun, and even paddle steamers on the lake outside serving food. This would be a place the North East could be proud of. Planned to cost over 50 million pounds, the development was set to open in phases over multiple years. John Hall said that the town needed to look towards its future and change to bring people to it. The Metro Centre would be the place to raise the standards in the Northeast, designed for the people, not just for the money, and not just a place to come and shop. This would be an experience that was planned to be much more. John and his wife May had traveled the world to see what would work for the new centre. After visiting the Eaton Centre in Toronto and West Edmonton Mall in Alberta, Canada, the then current largest shopping mall in the world, they learned that those places had the right feeling and they wanted to bring that back to the people of the UK. West Edmonton had an indoor amusement park known as Fantasyland, now Galaxyland, that opened in 1983. John Hall was inspired by this to make one for himself back in Gateshead, a place that an indoor amusement park would be perfect. Living up here in the northeast, there's a lot of rain and gray, and there's nowhere to go, especially in the cold of winter. So he built an indoor palace for them, 
there was a place they could escape to. The, he tried to build it so it's sort of Caribbean with all the palm trees and the spaces. The architecture is unique, and it's unlike sort of the drab exterior of the rest of uh, some of the places that his inhabitants were living in. The UK version of this huge shopping centre would feature four major anchor stores and almost 200 shops at the opening. Metro Centre was designed to be a place for one-stop shopping, a place with wide open walkways, lots of light and nature, along with highly themed areas, creating an enticing place that people wanted to visit. Throughout 1985, big retail names were announced to be coming to the upcoming shopping mecca. Marks & Spencer, Carrefour, Argos, House of Fraser, all the large retailers were interested in this new project. John Hall warned that the pattern of retailing in the UK was about to change. It would never be the same in city centres again. Financed by the Church Commissioners of England, the first phase, the Red Mall, opened in April 1986, bringing a huge boost to the local economy. The giant shopping centre changed retail overnight in the UK, and many large shopping centres that would follow would try and offer something similar, each trying to match what was offered in Gateshead. After the other shopping wings opened, it was clear that the Metro Centre wasn't just your average retail location. It was a full experience. Just two years later, in 1988, another phase of a huge project opened. Inspired by Galaxyland, the £20 million largest indoor amusement park in Europe, Metroland, would be a place designed to bring even more people to the Metro Centre. King Wizard's Castle and, and the whole uh, kingdom is really an addition to make shopping a more pleasurable experience. Uh, we find people will come and spend an hour here and then go shopping. More often though we'll find people when they're thinking about going shopping on the back of their mind, well let's go to Metro Center because there's one more thing there to offer. We find that people come from a greater distance to the Metro Center because they know they can come and enjoy this or the children can do this while they go and shop. Um, so it's an integration, really, of leisure and shopping at its highest level. Designed by Rush and Tompkins, who had worked on the shopping centre design, the UK's only indoor amusement park, Metroland, was free to walk into and would become a huge part of the shopping experience, especially for children. The amusement park for the first year would be managed by Forex who was also responsible for the West Edmonton Mall. Those visiting would find a mirror-clad, 55-foot tall building located in the Yellow Mall section. Inside, it was filled with attractions. Next door was a large, state-of-the-art arcade, as well as multiple food offerings. A further £1 million was invested by Funday LTD, who took over the park after a year in 1989. While the opening day was filled with ride breakdowns, the amusement park was instantly a success. After heading up the escalator, the inside of the amusement park would remain essentially the same throughout its whole existence. With 12 rides, the park offered a wide range of experiences for those visiting. Some of these attractions included the wonderful wave swinger, swashbuckling pirate ship, beautiful balloons ferris wheel, the disco dodgems, the fabulous fighters, and also multiple slides that if you were not careful, left some impressive burns. There was a train safari as well as some waltzers. This was the cool ride for the larger visitors. Two of these attractions, the Whirling Waltzers and the Montezumas, were operated by external companies. However, in April 2003, Metroland ended the lease and would now operate the attractions themselves, allowing them to be incorporated into the park's wristband price. The highlight of the park was the roller coaster, called just Roller Coaster. The family coaster would have two friction wheel drive lifts and had 1,194 feet of track, reaching heights of 48 feet as it wound throughout the area on its 60 second journey. Reaching speeds of nearly 27 miles per hour, the Ziera TOV Custom Coaster would be a rite of passage for children in the Northeast. One that scared many children as they headed into that tunnel. The park even featured mascots roaming around for guests to take pictures of. King Wiz was in charge here. Here we go. This, this is the, the king's very own version of how Metroland built. And it's a full story from our very first thoughts of it and how we worked with the king to make it come together.
Metroland was a huge spot for children's parties from the region, and was even featured in an episode of Biker Grove. The park would offer bands and musicians free slots to perform in the evenings. Cheryl from Girls Aloud frequently performed at the park. Boyzone, joined by iconic postman Pat, launched a balloon race within the attraction for children in need. The Irish pop group would sell kisses for one pound per person. This was part of a charity stunt for the park. They didn't just love kissing fans in amusement park. In 1995, Ronald McDonald opened the Party Express train that would take children through the Robert Louis Stevenson's Treasure Island Children's Book. It was launched in partnership with McDonald's as they had launched a successful birthday party package with Metroland that year. Children would often end their day at the park with a Happy Meal. The children's parties were so popular that the attraction had to develop a new themed room to cope with demand. Good afternoon, sir. Hello. Fun Day management were having issues with the owners of the Metro Center and took them to court over the way service charges were being calculated and refused to pay them until it was settled. Shortly after, new management was brought in. In August 1996, the park was relaunched as the new Metroland, when Arlington Leisure took over the park. Arlington Leisure had experience running family entertainment centres across the UK. They invested over £2 million, updating and upgrading the attractions and the experience inside. The roller coaster would have a new name, the new roller coaster. Yeah, that was it. They added the new before. It was exactly the same as before, except the supports were painted. This new aspect of the park was used to try and make Metroland feel fresh without actually having to really do very much. While it was mostly the same inside, it did bring some more people to visit the attraction. While nearly all the UK amusement parks would have to close for the winter, Metroland would be able to open seven days a week year round. It was extremely popular, with millions of visitors each year, and in 2005, the park still remained popular for those visiting the shopping center. It was a perfect slice of the 80s and 90s that still existed, and over 1.2 million people were paying to ride the offerings each year. It was in the top 10 visited tourist attractions in the whole country. Metroland attempted to add new attractions, but issues with the terms of the lease with the new owners of the Metro Center, Capital Shopping Centers, caused multiple issues and prevented it from happening. Over the next decade, the shopping center was gradually updated, with much of the unique theming and leisure offerings removed piece by piece. Metroland, however, operated basically untouched for 20 years. While remaining popular, it was becoming more and more outdated, and less and less desirable to visit, with many people now put off by some of the guests who would spend time there. Rumours began to circulate that the attraction may be closed. Everything in the Metro Centre is designed to make shopping fun, and it works. Every week, a third of a million people come here to spend twice as much as they would elsewhere. There was a huge effort spent on trying to save Metroland. The campaign was incredibly well known, and the original designer, Sir John Hall, was even back in it. He said that when he built the Metro Center, he took inspiration from abroad, where shopping was a family event. It was never the intention for the Metro Center to be just a retail shopping center. It was for everyone. It meant leisure, not just rows of shops. The main thing is that we did it ourselves here in the Northeast. We didn't use any of the pundits from London or any of the experts from down in the southeast. We did it here, where the talent of the people has always been here. You know, we built the biggest ships, the biggest engineering products, the biggest armaments in our industrial time. Now, in a sense, we have to bring ourselves forward and do the same things in the new way, the modern way, whatever those industries might be. And that's what I'm trying to do. This is what this place represents. With thousands of signatures and many letters of objection, the petitions did little to stop the plans. In late 2007, the closure was confirmed. Metroland's final day of operation would be Sunday, April 20th, 2008. Arlington Leisure would hand back the property to CSC two months later, and the yellow wing of the shopping center would be fully renovated. Metroland would become just a memory of the past. The park offered a last ride weekend where for just five pounds, visitors could ride unlimited times all day with the proceeds going to charity. The majority of the attractions were sold, and the large area was completely cleared out. Signs and everything inside were auctioned off, and 120 employees lost their jobs. 
many of which had worked at the park for many years. The replacement for the iconic park would be a new cinema, along with new chain restaurants. Metroland was still incredibly popular when it closed, and continued to be in the top 10 visited tourist attractions in the UK. But hey, at least now we had Dickens World. Dickens, Charles Dickens. The shopping centre's owners had decided, rather than spend money to update and offer more inside, it made more sense to close the park, as it didn't bring that much money compared to further retail offerings. CSC said that the next phase of this area of the Yellow Wing would continue to offer the best in modern shopping for local visitors and people. The original cinema at the centre was replaced with more retail, and a new one was built on the site of the former amusement park. It would open in 2010 as part of the Metro Centre Cube. The majority of the uniqueness of this once iconic location in the northeast of England was completely gone. You could find a shopping mall anywhere. A shopping mall with an amusement park, however, was something unique. The northeast is an area which is a family area. We all lived in villages, we're very much family orientated. Uh, it's, it's dissipated to a degree, you know, with the, with the way society's gone. I'm trying to bring it back here. I'm trying to take what's good from the past and put it into a modern idiom. That's what I'm trying to do. I learn from the past. I don't want to live in it, but I want to take the good things. And a sort of society was basically, you know, the, the niceness about some of the things of the past, like getting together. The family unit is the essence of life, and that's what it's all. And this centre is built around the family unit, and this is what the North East is, a family unit. In 2020, the owners of the shopping centre, who had removed many of those original aspects, now called Into, collapsed into administration. They owned 17 different retail centres, and each of them had nothing to make them stand out over the others. The Metro Centre is now in the hands of Sovereign Centros, an independent real estate operating partner. In 2016, at the Big Sheep in Northern Devon, the farm-themed amusement park opened a new roller coaster. The very same ride that so many children had their first experience of a roller coaster was back. After eight years in storage, the Metroland coaster had found a new home, and to honour its past, for a short period after opening, the Big Sheep offered free rides to visitors from the northeast of England. Now called Rampage, the attraction is still in operation today. When opening, the Metro Centre was quite opposed by locals, as it would bring American ideas to the UK as part of the retail experience. The Metroland Park was seen as just a distraction that would stop people from spending money on shopping. Many even just called it an elaborate children's crash that parents could drop their kids at to have fun while they shopped. Over its 20 years of operation, the small indoor amusement park was the place of many happy memories from not only families of the Northeast, but the whole of the UK. John Hall's creation was a success. People all over the country had heard of the huge, expansive shopping centre up north. One that would be much more than just a mall, and even had a roller coaster inside. It was a place families could come and enjoy shopping together, exactly what John Hall had envisioned. Who doesn't want to go to a place where there's gnomes themed to each of the mall's colours? The Metro Centre would remain the largest shopping centre in the UK until 2018. Many of the elements that had made it unique have now been removed. Metroland wasn't perfect, and it definitely was not the best amusement park in the world, but there is something special about those 90s entertainment centres that can't be found today. A place that was before its time. And while the Metro Centre still exists today, the true core of the family-friendly, standout leisure and retail experience in the north of England is extinct. All that remains is just another failing shopping centre.